Your personal brand is made up of three things. Your skills, mm -hmm. your experience, your personality. Mm -hmm. So everybody has an audience. You just haven't found it yet. When you walk into a room with a lot of high profile people, how do you work the room? I'm always going to make sure that when I talk to someone, they know those three things about me. I have to think these people have unlimited resources. What is it that I can offer them? I learned a lot from my father. He passed away, but uh, he did teach me a lot about like, if not you, who? You know, if you don't do it, who's going to do it? You're capable of doing it. Hi, guys, and welcome to The Pulp Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest. It's someone who I truly admire for her work ethic and uh, her ability to kind of just make a room come to life. Okay, so today we have a personal branding specialist. Her name is Maha Abul Anin, and she has previously been the uh, head of comms at Google she works closely with Gary V, Deepak Chopra, and um, many others. I want to say their names. Can I? Can I Whatever. say? Can I say Michelle Obama? I didn't work for Michelle Obama. You didn't work for her, but you worked with with the Obama administration. The Obama administration. All right. Without further ado, welcome, Maha. Thank you so much. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. 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 Okay. I'm so excited we are doing this today because we are here to celebrate the debut. Of your book. Yes. Okay. You have written a, a book called The Seven Rules of Self-Reliance. Yes. It's right here, guys, if you, if you, you know, didn't, didn't see, see it. it. Um, look, I am not one to read books in like in, in a, in like a, like a short amount of time, but yep. with your book, I seriously, I was so engaged because you spoke so, um, just, you were real. You were real about the fact that you didn't have something and then you were like, now I'm gonna get it. Yeah. So I wanna know where, where was it in your life that you knew that self-reliance was your superpower? Actually, I didn't know self-reliance was my superpower. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, I've had a lot of challenges and things that I had to face in my life. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I, when I took a time to reflect on my career and my personal life, yeah. it was, I had to really rely on myself. Yep. And it wasn't about being independent or not needing other people. That's not what self-reliance means. Mm -hmm. Self-reliance means how to be resourceful. Okay. Self-reliance means what are the skills you need to rely on yourself to get what you want out of your life mm -hmm. and not wait for permission from other people, not wait for other people to do it for you. But hey, guess what? If you have skills and tools, you can do anything you want. 100%. But you know, with the self-reliance kind of concept, I feel like you really need to have that confidence. Like, where do you, do you find that confidence? Yeah, self-reliance has a lot to do with believing in yourself mm -hmm. and having self-confidence. And I feel like I I learned a lot from my father. He passed away, but uh, he did teach me a lot about like, if not you, who? Mm. You know, if you don't do it, who's going to do it? You're capable of doing it. Mm. Believe in yourself. You know, yeah. sometimes clients had given me assignments or asked me to do something. I'm like, I don't think I can do it. But I'm like, if they believe in me, why don't I believe in myself? Oh. And so what I'm going to have to do is outwork. I'm going to have to outstudy. I'm going to have to outlearn so that I can do the things that I feel like I might not be capable of doing or I yeah. might not have the confidence to do. But it's just a matter of putting your head down and doing the work and putting in the effort. The chapter where you spoke about writing a speech for uh, one of the Egyptian prime ministers at the time. Yes. I was getting like, anxiety like for you because <laughs> I was like how did she manage to talk herself into this because that is such a big job if you fail at that you're done you're done you're done you're done <laughs> you're done there's no easy way about it so I tell yeah. a story in the book of how I uh, got introduced to the prime minister of Egypt mm -hmm. and he asked me to write his uh, write a speech for him yep Okay, I'm not a speech writer. Mm -hmm. I am not a policy speech writer. I know nothing about Egyptian government, Egyptian politics. I am this American kid fresh out of the boat, just moved to Egypt, barely mm -hmm. speak any Arabic. Mm -hmm. And here I was asked to do something really important for the government. And when the government asks you to do something, you can't really say no. I'm I'm not good at that. I can't do it. Yeah. Um. So they said, "Well, you do this speech, and we want you to work." And I'm like, "Okay, just give me all the files. I'll just go home and collect myself off the floor and think about it. Yeah. Sweat in my own private <laughs> living room instead of having to do it in front of them. And they're like, "No, no, no, no. The papers stay here. You stay here. 
you have to sit in this office, come mm. every day until you knock out a speech. Right. I was terrified. I was terrified. That is, that is, uh, I don't know. Yeah, you would say like rolling in your own sweat. Like that is, how did you manage to take that first step, which is saying yes? Like how? Well, I, I, first of all, I was kind of forced to say yes, but mm. then I was like, okay, girl, what well, you got to figure this out. And so, you know, obviously apply yourself, work hard, study, learn, listen. But I spent time thinking about, and this was the game changer that allowed me to just to do the job that they had tasked me with. It was like, what would I want to hear if I was in the audience? Right. And the minute I kind of put myself in the shoes of the audience, I got out of my own way. I got out of my own head and I'm like, okay, think of as an audience member, what would you want to hear? Right. And I was a citizen. I was a consumer. So that was easy. The minute mm -hmm. I had that mindset shift or mind, yeah, shift in my mindset, <laughs> I was able to like fl freely write that speech and deliver it and polish it and edit it based on that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of times in communications with our personal brand or when we're on social media, yeah. we get in our own way. We overthink it. We're like, oh, I don't know what to post. Oh, I don't want people to judge me. Or I don't want people to say, why is she saying that? Or who does she think she is by posting that? Mm -hmm. You know, if you have an expertise or you have something you think you can share, share it. Nobody's judging you as much as you're usually judging yourself. That is a fantastic words to end by. And the podcast is over. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> no, this, that's, uh, that is something that I think that a lot of people kind of just put on the side, like kind of just brush off as in no, like, you know, it's not true. But then you always have to find the evidence that something is true, that you are good enough, that you are, that you have made a difference, for example, because when you do put something out and people react, you're like, oh shit, like I didn't realize that people are actually liking this content yeah. or whatever it is. So, I mean, I, I, I tell the story of this, you know, you, you never know where your audience is or where your audience comes from. Mm -hmm. So everybody has an audience. You just haven't found it yet. Right. So yeah. there are a million personal trainers out there. Why is this personal trainer who's thinking about starting a social media account going to succeed? Mm -hmm. you know, your personal brand is made up of three things, your skills, mm -hmm. your experience and your personality. Okay. So you might match someone else's skills and experience, but they don't have your personality. Like yep. your podcast brings you to the table, your style, mm. your personality, your way of talking to guests, your mm. way of coming off on social media that's different than other people. And that's yeah. why people listen to the Pulp Podcast, right? Okay. So yeah. I feel like you need to also think about with your personal brand and when you come to do storytelling, what's unique to you that you want to share with the world. Right. So when you were doing that speech, when you were writing the speech, did you have anyone there that you could kind of pull for support at any point? Or were you like, this is me. It's a one man show. I got to do it myself. Yeah, I was kind of on my own because you're also working with government stuff that's confidential. So you can't really right. talk to anybody about it like mm -hmm. this. I couldn't, the files couldn't leave the room. Yeah. But in terms of like even <laughs> studying the audience, because you had to know what the, where the audience was from. Yeah. For like I basically had to study, like he's going to go speak at Georgetown or George Washington University or the Council on Foreign Relations or the World Economic Forum. I yeah. had to like, you know, spend some time listening to, you know, videos and seeing who's in the audience, what other speech, speech speakers talked about. So I feel you have to do your homework. You don't go in cold, yeah. but you have to have that cultural nuances, the context, like of the time and the place in history, the time and place of his personality, the time and place in Egypt's history. So you have to take a lot of factors into place. Well, the reason why I asked that question also is because, you know, when we talk about self-reliance or when you were talking about it in the book, you, you said that self-reliance isn't about just trying to do everything on your own. A hundred percent. So it's not, that's not what it's about. So when should you ask for help? Like when is it the right time? So it's about having that self-awareness of knowing what am I good at? What am I not good at? Mm. What can I actually do myself and what either skills or help do I need from others? Okay. So self-reliance is about knowing, okay, I can rely on myself to uh, drive change, to write a story, but I might need somebody to help me with the photography or with the videos. Okay. Like I can rely on myself to figure out the what, but I might need help with the how. Mm. Okay, the execution. Yes. Right. So that's also knowing yourself, right? So you got to know what you can do, what you yep. can bring to the table. What you're capable of doing. And then have other people who are specialized in their industries. Help you out. Help you out. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of times, you know, a lot of people join a company or even if they're an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. they expect their managers to give them a project that's gonna make them a rock star. Or I'm gonna get an opportunity, my manager's gonna wake up one day and say, listen, Maha, I want you 
to, you know, show us what you're capable of. Here's a project to demonstrate you're amazing right. and to get that promotion. That's usually not how it works. Nobody yeah. comes and appoints you with a crown and says, this is the one that's going to make your career. Huh? You need to go for it. You need to put in the work. You need to be listening and learning about what's happening in the organization. Where can you add the most value? Where can you step up? Where can you contribute in a way that they didn't ask you for? Right. Right. Which I love that you said that because it's going to take me to my next point, which is about adding value, right? You are very, very adamant about, you know, add value where you see fit. But I, I've heard this term so many times and I just want to kind of let's break it down for the audience a little bit. How do we add value? What kind of what does that look like and what does it mean to add value? Because adding value can mean, hey, I can give you a job. Right? I can invite you to this party. What is it to you? So adding value to me is finding out what is valuable to you and then simply delivering on that. So in order to create mm -hmm. value for other people, you have to really get to know them. You have to listen. You have to mm -hmm. understand what makes them tick, what is valuable for them, what do they care about, and then find ways to do it. Is it sending them an article? Is it introducing them to somebody? Is it finding a collaboration opportunity for them? Is it opening a business opportunity for them? Is mm -hmm. it connecting them to somebody else and being a super connector with through a relationship. Right. You can create value for people in many ways, mm -hmm. small and big. Mm -hmm. You can create value for your friends or for your family by helping them with some information or connecting them to someone they really want to get to know. Okay. And I feel like if you create value for people, you ultimately create value for yourself because you get experience, mm -hmm. you get the know-how, you get the added advantage of being the person that delivered that value to the other side. And I really think that a lot of people um, want to take in relationships, want to figure out what's in it for me, what am I yeah. gonna get? I wanna take, take, take. Yep. And so the concept of being a value creator is about giving, about giving value to the other side, mm. doing something that makes you sticky for them, that makes you someone that they don't want to, they want to keep in their circle and their orbit because you're always creating value. Right. So I've worked with some very powerful people in big companies, the Googles, the Netflixes, mm -hmm. the Kareems, the Ubers, yep. the Nagib Sawiris, the Gary V. I have to think these people have unlimited resources. Mm -hmm. What is it that I can offer them? They have anyone that they can call with the, yeah, you know, they have access to money and people at their fingertips. Yeah. So I have to be smart. I have to think, okay, well, Gary V has 60 million followers mm -hmm. across his platforms. He's got 2000 person company. Mm -hmm. why, why does he need me? What can I do for him? So I have to find what are the lanes where I feel like he might need support and right. either save him time, okay. save him money give him access to the market, give him access to people, make introductions and connections. That's what creating value is all about. And in the book, mm. I explain in detail how to create value for other people. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's why <laughs> I loved it. I was like, okay, good. So speaking of you adding value in terms of when you first started working with Gary Vee, tell us a little bit of a insight, like give us a little bit of a, you know, what was the thing that you thought, okay, this is what I'm going to add value to Gary Vee with that is unique to you when you first well, started working with him. One is the Middle East. So yeah. like I lived here for 23 years. I have relationships in media with CEOs, with government officials. That's not somebody that walks in the door every day that has the relationships as deep as I do. Mm -hmm. So how can I educate him about the market, share with him about the Middle East, bring him on his first trip to Dubai, bring him on his first trip to Saudi Arabia. Okay. We haven't gone to Egypt yet, but you better believe we will. Yeah. I will be the first person to take him to Egypt because I'm Egyptian. I said, do you dare go without me? Yeah, yeah. So I feel that's how I can create value is I can show the strengths of my region, mm -hmm. the promise of the communities here, the entrepreneurship, the, you know, the social media, like there's a lot that I can help. And I've, I'm uniquely qualified because I'm from the region. I am yeah. American. I do know how businessmen in America think. I do know his global ambition. So that's kind of the one value thing that I feel like, okay, there might be a lot of people from the Middle East that can do that. Mm -hmm. Do they have my unique set and skills and relationships? No. So that's kind of the different thing. Like they may have a different set of relationships. Right. Um, and so I feel like that's my value proposition and my unique, you know, uh, value proposition. And I, I love bringing him to the region. It's pretty fun. Yeah. I mean, he's an awesome guy. I've, we've met you, him. We've met, met him. him. He's awesome. I interviewed him. Let's talk about value proposition. The value that you bring uniquely to the table. Yep. How can one sit down with themselves 
And is there like a Venn, Venn diagram? Like how do we sit and like, do this for the people who are watching, who really want to know how they can start reaching out to networks. Yeah. So I have a process where I help people figure out what is it that they, what's their secret sauce? What right. is the thing that they're a value creator for and process of how to kind of audit it and define it and to find it. Mm. But I think the unique thing about um, this book and how I, I've approached my career is that taking time to reflect on some of the skills that you have and the things that you really feel like you're really good at. Like, what mm -hmm. are, like, are you really good with people? Are you really good at problem solving? Right. Are you really good at project managing? Are you really good at uh, talking to people? Like, whatever it is that you think that might be, that might be the value creation that you can build your life or your career or your business or your unique value proposition on. Right. And I feel like in terms of the networking, I feel like now more than ever, having a network is really important. Yes. You know, uh, if we face another pandemic, you're going to have to have the right relationships. If you're an entrepreneur and you need to do something for your business, if you're employed at a company, your company mm -hmm. wants to make sure that you have good relationships in the market. It's all about reputation mm -hmm. and networking now happens in many formats. It happens at events and conferences. It happens one-to-one. -one. It mm -hmm. happens one-to-many. It happens in social media. Mm -hmm. How do you do that DM on LinkedIn so it doesn't look spammy? Yeah. How do you DM somebody off of Instagram to get that off the DM and into an email, into a meeting, into Teams or meeting on Zoom? Oh, that's so You important. have to learn how to network and how to build those relationships. I just want to say one last thing about a network because yeah. a lot of people think a network is there to serve them. Like I need to ask my network right. for favors to get a job or to give me a connection or mm. introduce me to someone. It's the opposite. It's about serving your network, nurturing your network, figuring out what you can do to your network so that they bring you into their network. Right. What about walking to a, into a room? When you walk into a room with a lot of high profile people, how and do I do you, it every day. How do you work the room? How Okay, there is one way, for example, knowing how to add value when you're like behind a desk, right? You're behind the email. Keyboard, it's Nobody easy. can look you at can me. See. <laughs> but when, you, when you're there in the flesh and you're at, at a party or an, an event, how do you, is there like a, is, do you have a strategy? There's a strategy. There's a whole chapter in the book about it. But here's the thing. Don't go into an event cold. Yeah. You're going to an event, you're going to a party, you know that there's going to be some people there that you're not sure exactly who's going to attend, but they're going to be people in that event that you want to meet, which is why you're there. Mm -hmm. So have a couple of thought starters of what you want to talk about. Yeah. Have a couple of thought starters uh, for the conversation. Like if you're not sure like how to open or how to introduce yourself, prepare. Yeah. Don't go in cold because you might have anxiety. You might be overwhelmed. You might be starstruck. Then you want to make sure like, okay, if Muhammad Abbar is at this event, mm -hmm. what am I going to say to him? Don't think of it on the spot. Think of it in advance. Yeah. Okay. Right. If you see someone that you really want to meet is speaking on a stage and they come off the stage and you're like, I really want to meet them to get a selfie or to talk to them about my company or to get them to like know who I am so I can mm -hmm. follow them on LinkedIn, whatever. Okay. Have a plan. Have a plan. Have a plan. Okay. This is very similar to what um, Anthony Bourdain once said, actually. He said, not not going to a networking event, but going to dinner. Going to a dinner. Imagine. Really? Have at least five to seven stories ready. Yeah. Stories, imagine. He's like planning what he's going to say because when you're sitting there with somebody or you're going up to speak to someone, know what you're go what know what value you're going to add to the yeah. to the conversation. Yeah, the other thing too is like when we I talk a lot in about key messages and what you should be talking about, what do you stand for? What is your personal brand about? Like who are you and what do you want people to know about you, mm -hmm. right? If I get a chance to talk to somebody important, yeah. what do I want them to know about me? I want them to know I'm Egyptian. Mhm. Mm I want them to know I do communications. Okay. I want them to know my favorite thing, which is probably going to, I'm probably going to ask them, how can I help? Right. Like that. I, I'm always going to make sure that when I talk to someone, they know those three things about me. Okay. That I'm from the Middle East. Yep. That I do comms mm -hmm. and I want to help. Okay. So that's very good. So that's kind of like a, um, it's not, it's not for me. It's mm. for you. Yeah. I'm here for you. <laughs> okay. What do you think about doing free work? I, I believe in it. Mm -hmm. I believe in it, but you need to do it in a very strategic way. Yeah. So yeah. you need to do it when it's not, it's a calculated decision right. that you're going to work for free for somebody important because it's going to give you the chance to earn, to learn something. Mm -hmm. So in, when you have a job or a career, you're either learning or earning. Mm -hmm. Am I learning a lot in this role? Then I'm probably not going to make that much money, but I'm going to be learning, getting access to information, access to relationships, access to the industry, access to knowledge. 
So when I make a decision about, I worked for free for Gary for several, for like a more than a year, almost a year and a really? half. Yeah. Okay. Be, I saw, but I, I only use my time for free, not my team, not my company's resources, okay. not other stuff. But yeah. like, if I feel like it's an important relationship for me to cultivate and that's how long it's going to take, that's how long it took. Right. Right. So working for free, you should never do it on a regular basis. Mm. You shouldn't do it for everyone. You should be, have, you know, a calculated plan. Like I'm doing it because this is a relationship that'll help me with something else. Or this right. is a relationship that if I get this experience for free from this person, when I come to want to charge someone for do it, then I know how to do it. And so don't give away your services, value okay. yourself, know okay. your value, yep. know exactly what you're worth. But if there's an opportunity that comes that's important, you have to make that decision. If you have that opportunity cost, can I afford to do it for free? For how long can I do it? Put a time limit on it understand the scope and size of what you're willing to do for free mm. and stick to your boundaries. And is it worth my time basically? Like, yeah, that's, that, definitely. That, that's, is it worth my time to, cause it's a lot of energy. It is energy to give, but if you want to give, if you feel like you're getting fed from that energy, once you give it at yeah. the same time, that's when you know what's the right decision. Yeah. So Matt Higgins is a shark on shark tank in the U S teaches a Harvard class, a big businessman in the U S mm. And he'd never been to the Middle East. And I've been always talking to people like, you should come if you ever want to go, let me know. And then he gave me like seven days notice. He's like, I want to go in next week. And three of those days were a national holiday. So I didn't have much time to pull together a visit for him. Okay. But he said, come with me. And I'm like, oh, and I also need to drop everything I'm doing to go overseas. And it was like a lot of work, planning meetings, thinking about his business. Who should he meet with? Right. Who should he talk to? What should I What should I organize on his itinerary so he can learn about the market and the culture and meet people and not just, you know, deal with government officials, but all actual entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. make it a mix. So yeah, there's a science behind when you do these visits to make sure they walk away with a good understanding of the culture and the people and the nuances. Right. And as much as you can do in a couple of day visit. And, you know, I worked for free. I didn't, he was on a client, okay. but I, I really valued spending time with him. I really valued mm -hmm. getting to learn from him. I really valued his expertise and I'll get to spend unlimited hours with him on the car and meetings, traveling that I, it's like very valuable. He's a huge chairman of a big company. He's yeah. a big businessman. He's really important. He's got a lot of ideas that could help me in my business. And mm -hmm. so I made a calculated, you know, decision, decision. To, to do that for him. And uh, now he's a client and now I work with him very closely oh, and wow. he's extraordinary and he's been to the region like four or five times ever since. That's amazing. There you go, folks. <laughs> That's awesome. I, one of the topics that I really loved in the, in the book was that you were talking, it was, I don't know if it was a topic, but it was kind of like a, an intro to one of the chapters. And you were saying about how business in the Middle East is done so differently than business in the U.S. Of course. I just... Because we, you know, we are a bunch of expats here living in, in Dubai. And I really, really want to know, what have you learned? What have you learned that you were like, oh man, this is so different. So different. Yeah. So different. In, in every way, shape or form. Okay. Tell us. So American speed is move fast and break things. Okay. You know, go, 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 get down to business. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have to dilly dally and chit chat and like get down to the business and we need to get results and performance driven and all those things. The Middle East is also results driven, performance driven, mm -hmm. but how you get there is very different. All yeah. business is personal. I need to ask about you, about your family. I need to spend that time cultivating a relationship. You need to know who my family is. I need to know who your family is. We spend time. Last names. Yeah, we spend yeah. time building a relationship. And then if business comes from that, as yeah. we say, good yeah. things can come out of that. Right. But if not, you've built an important relationship and you've made a deposit in someone's trust bank and you built a good reputation, then they might refer you to somebody who does. So I feel mm -hmm. like the system of getting down to business, sending that email, you don't do that. I learned that the hard way in Egypt. I, you know, I was like, you know, wanted to get in there and get shit done. And yeah. I'm like, you can't do that here. You need yeah, to really... Yeah. Take it down a notch, yep. work at their Relax, speed. Have a coffee. Have a coffee, mm. drink a coffee yeah. or a cup of tea yeah. or two or three before you get down to business. Right. And you know what? I've had so many longstanding relationships because somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, listen, this is how we do things around here. Yeah. You are American, but now you're here. You <laughs> need to here. run at our speed. And I learned uh, very quickly because someone cared enough about me to tell me because I didn't have that self-awareness at the time. Mm. And- it, it makes all the difference. And so when people come here, I'm like, we don't do this. And this is like, you know, take oh, wow. the advice on how to do it. Right. Because 
you will succeed. You know, there's a lot of back channeling that happens. Like Mm -hmm. I might talk to you. I don't ask you directly for the business. I don't do the clothes. I might have someone back channel and find out your feedback first. So you can save face. You don't have to say no to me. There's a lot of things like that. Like you have to rely on relationships with the people that know people. You can't Mm -hmm. just go in and do things. You have to really have a circle around you of people that can actually build that relationship and and support you. For the Middle East stuff. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we are so, um, the businesses are so based on like trust, right? Like just kind of know thy neighbor kind of vibe, 100%. right? Like and trust is about reputation and reputation is your name and your mm-hmm. name is all you have. And so focus on how do you build it? How do you protect it? All that kind of stuff. You know, it's funny because for example, for me, that sounds so natural because I've been here for a long time and I've worked in Jordan. I've also worked in Australia, but I feel like now that whole kind of, you know, mingling just comes naturally. And that's what you have to do to, to get. I actually enjoy it. I love it. You get to know the real person. It's not a business transaction. And that's when Mm -hmm. you have that relationship, you understand how they tick, what they care about, but you actually are vested in them. And I love that. Like I want to do business with people they genuinely know what they care about and who they are. Uh, Yeah. And you genuinely like them. Right. So that's why you're spending uh, more and more time with them. But what I was going to say also is that I, so when I was living in Australia, I think a lot of the, I had some trouble when I was working there because I didn't have that. There was no like, let's have a chat over coffee before we do like these huge projects. Yeah. How did you manage that in the States? Like just, you know, not having that back and forth. Are you okay? Like, were you like, okay, this is what I have to do. And, and how do people in America, for example, get that closeness to like, make important deals happen. I mean, they do it in America. I'm not saying that they don't do it, yeah, but it's not to the, so. like, to the extent of the Middle East hospitality, uh, the Middle East pace, the Middle East speed is much different than doing okay. business in the U S as it would be different in China or Europe or For anywhere sure. else around the yes. world. And I feel like even, you know, in the States, I mean, business has changed a lot since COVID, you know, mm-hmm. remote working has changed a lot of things, how we look at hybrid working, how we interact on Zoom, how yeah. we motivate each other, how we take mental health breaks, how we take time to like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm going to go for a walk and instead of doing this on a Zoom call and, and do a walking call instead, like mm-hmm. you have to take those breaks and pace yourself and understand how you work. And right. the work-life balance shift in the U.S. has changed dramatically. And I feel like a lot of people want the power back in into their, their life. Mm. And work fits into it versus the reverse. This is, um, it's it's like someone should write, write a book on that. Cause like people need I to have a guidebook on how to do business in every country. <laughs> um, okay, let's go back to self-reliance a little bit. I wanna know what has been your like biggest sec- setback in your career and how- So many. And how how have you used your self-reliance to get, to get out of it? I, yeah. I mean, I, I, let me just put this into context for you. I was 27 when I moved to Egypt. Mm. I barely spoke any Arabic. I didn't have a job. My mother was uh, fully disabled. She had multiple sclerosis. And I had my dad moved to the UAE to work for the Amir in Sharjah to build the American University in Sharjah Business School. Mm. And I just dropped myself in Egypt. Like, I got to find a job, I got to make hard. friends. I don't have high school friends, college friends, professional friends. I don't know anybody. That's That's the ultimate like uh, lesson in (laughs) self-reliance. I had to like, yeah, it was hard. It was very hard. And my mom was like fully disabled. So I needed full-time nursing care. And I'm like, okay, "Okay, I got to find a job. I got to make friends. What am I going to do? So I had to like rely on myself. I got to figure out how to do this. I got to figure out how to navigate this country and this, you know, I'm a hundred percent Egyptian yet I haven't worked as a professional in Egypt. And now I got to like figure that out. That was a challenge, but I just took it one day at a time. You know, you got to win each day separately and just focus on the next day and the next day and the next day. And then you build a network and you get friends and you start to ask for advice and Mm. you start like, I joined the American chamber of commerce, which was a game changer for me because I started to meet a lot of people and professionals and it's hard making friends when you're an adult. Of course it is. Of course, because you feel like you just need that so much more time to kind of gain trust. I don't know, maybe because when you're younger, you're a little bit more open to meeting people. Everyone's on the same journey in high school, college, Mm -hmm. everyone's on the same schedule timeline in their lives. Yes. And now it's 27. Some people are, very successful. Some people are still trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives. Some people are in corporate. Some people are in entrepreneurs. 
It was a it was a mix of everything. How long did it take you, you think? How long did it take you to find your footing? Uh, it took me a long time, Yeah, uh, I'll be honest with you. It took me a good five, six, seven years into it to figure out, okay, this is how you work in the Middle East and yeah. this is how I'm going to operate here. It was hard. Well, I mean, not only that, I mean, you were managing some harsh, like, personal life it, problems. Yeah, after my mom got sick, my mom was sick when we moved to Egypt. My dad acquired ALS. He had Lou Gehrig's disease. I talk about it, uh, the last chapter of the book. Yeah. Uh, and, and I had two parents that needed me to manage them full time mm -hmm. at an age probably where I should have been the child and, and them the parent. But I, mm -hmm. I really like grew a lot. I learned a lot. Your struggles turn into your strengths and you mm -hmm. figure out what you're capable of and how to be patient and, yeah. and how to like time manage my career with my parents' needs. And I was going to be a good daughter and I was going to be dutiful to them. And I wasn't going to put them in a nursing home or any facility. I was going to do it mm -hmm. myself. And Luckily, I had the resources to bring in nurses and other help to, to help me get through it. But yeah, I mean, that's the ultimate test of self-reliant. Like, can you rely on yourself that to is. get dig yourself out of a hole? I mean, hopefully you're not in a hole, but mm -hmm. if you were to ever be in one, would you know how to get out? Uh, also, not a lot of people would, would do that. I mean, what, who instilled that kind of moral compass in you? Uh, my father, my okay. father was very much the, my guiding North star, mm -hmm. uh, when he was alive and, and every day since he has passed, mm -hmm. um, he's the one who said, you know, put your head down, put in the work, let your speak work for speak for itself. Mm -hmm. He's the one who told me, you know, the most important thing in your life needs to be acquiring knowledge because no one can take that away from you. And he's right. Like if I'm yeah. smart, you can't take anything away from me. Cause I know stuff. A hundred percent. I know things, bro. I know things, bro. It's true. <laughs> uh, that's that's awesome. I mean, that's a, that's a journey for sure because, you know, having to focus on things that are not, you know, wanting to be home. For example, you want to be home and to take care of your parents, for example, yet you have to go out. That's like a whole... Mastery, yeah. mastery of emotions. Yeah. I mean, you have obligations to your family, but like, I wouldn't have done that any other way. I've, yeah. That's why the chapter where I talk about my parents, it's called no regrets. I have no mm -hmm. regrets about it whatsoever. It's my story. It's my journey. It's the struggle that happened to me that became my strength. Mm -hmm. I learned how to push through that. And I'm like, if I can get through that, I can get through anything. Anything. That's amazing. I salute you for that. That's Thank why you. I admire you. That's Thank why you. I admire you. Um, there is... You talk about the seven rules. There are seven rules, yep. okay? Um, we, we, can, we can't go through all of them, but I want to know, I guess, I guess the, the hardest one for you to write. Which one was the hardest one? Was there one that would, where you were like, oh, it's, it's, um, it's kind of tough because I don't know, you know, like sometimes when we're like uh, creating uh, something, you, you have to go through so much of your backlog of information. Was there something where you're like, oh, I, you know, how do you choose seven, number one? Like that's yeah. very hard. So how did you, what was the hardest one for you to choose? Um, there weren't actually any that were hard okay. for me to choose. Um, I think the one chapter, which is the biggest chapter in the book, which is probably double the size any of the other chapters is the chapter about uh, your reputation as a currency. Like how to think of your reputation as a currency. What's its worth? What's its value? Mm. And I do a deep, deep dive into how to build your personal brand because that's what I do for senior executives. Yep. And I feel like that's the thing a lot of people want to know how to do. Like how do I do it without being self-promoting. Hey, look at me. I do. I know stuff. Yeah. It's not about that. It's not about self-promotion. It's about idea promotion. It's not about self-promotion. It's about thought leadership. It's not about self-promotion. It's about your reputation. Right. And so I spent a lot of time explaining it to people in detail, how to build it, how to do it exactly, mm -hmm. how I do it for Gary V, how I do it for other people. Like what yeah. are the things that you need to learn how to do right. in order to build and protect your reputation or to build your personal brand? Or if you're like, I'm a person, I don't, I'm not a personal brand. Yes, you are. Yeah, you are. And if you are not just on social media. This isn't about how to become an influencer. This right. is how do you treat your employees? How do you treat your friends? How do you treat your coworkers, your collaborators, your contractors, your vendors? Your reputation is all of you, not just your online you. You're right. And it's how you show up at networking events. It's how you show up at conferences. It's like Maha's energy, yes means uh, questions. Like mm -hmm. how, how can you be consistently inquisitive and curious and yeah. kind and loyal and supportive? That's your reputation. Did you ever find it hard when you were trying to make a, you know, prove yourself, especially like, I don't want to say as a female, cause like, I feel like that's like a, you know, saying that females are like uh, less than or weaker or whatever. But I feel like it is that when you walked into a, the prime minister's office and you had to write a speech, it's hard. Like, 
you know, is I was it, scared. Yeah. I was scared. I, when I, the, the, the opening, I think it's the opening story of the book or the opening story of one of the chapters was um, when I got offered to be an office manager Yeah, for a chairman of a company in the U S in, in, in Egypt, when I first moved to Egypt and I was like, is that women are just secretaries around here? Yeah, like yeah. that's the <laughs> typical job. The woman is the secretary. The man is the executive in the office. Like I was mortified. I was like, this is terrible. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I learned a lot that like an office manager is a senior role. It's like the chief of oh, okay, staff okay. to get to the chairman. <laughs> you have to go through the office manager. But I mean, I had to learn, I had a learning curve, but I, yeah. I always, especially my first formative years in Egypt, when I, after I left that company and became my own, like the head of my own company, you know, there weren't a lot of females that were managing directors of companies. And I called myself a managing director because I didn't think I should be a CEO. Yeah, right. Because a right. CEO was a guy's title. <laughs> Women aren't CEOs. Okay. Only the men are CEOs. <laughs> Women are managing directors. Yeah. So it's like it's a it's a head title that tells you I'm in charge, but it's not like the big chair. Right. Okay. I changed my title. So I you're like, now- I'm doing you a favor. I'm gonna call myself managing director. You can stay a CEO. <laughs> it's fine. I'm, I'm the CEO <laughs> of my company now. Well, you are a CEO now, yeah. That's great. Amazing. See? You got to own it. You if you, own I don't it. believe it, why would other people believe it? Yeah, 100%. Um, okay. What is one of your favorite seven rules of self-reliance? Uh, the one about lifelong learning. Okay. Because I feel like a lot of people need that curiosity. They need to be learning uh, uh, yeah. constantly. And you can learn from anywhere and you can learn for free. Yep. I'm not talking about formal education. I'm talking about YouTube videos, podcasts, books, people. You can learn from anywhere. And yeah. guess what? It's free. It's so I feel free. like the thing that people don't do the most is they're just, they rest on their laurels and yeah. they're not like curious about things, you know, learn how to keyboard, learn how to use Photoshop, learn how to do a podcast, yeah. learn how to paint, learn how to do yoga, learn how to lift weights. It's out there. There's so much in abundance. Learn how to code. Learn about AI. Yeah. And you know what's great about that is that it it always gets you out of a rut. Like whatever you're feeling, if you're feeling stuck, you're bored, it's usually because you're not learning. Yeah. You're, you're not, you're not like- You're not learning. You're not growing. And if you're not growing, you're probably like, feel like you're deteriorating. Like yeah. even learning things like learning how to cook, learning yeah. how to garden. Just hobbies. Learning out new things. It's really, really rewarding. Okay, let's talk about hustle culture a little bit. Okay. Now, I feel like there has been this kind of shift, right, after COVID. It was hustle culture, hustle, 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 hustle. And now it's a little bit more about adding, about value, about yeah. what the value that you're adding, as you say, the book. How can you shift your mindset? It's a very hard kind of mindset to shift because if you're somebody who's consi- working consistently, trying to make money here, there's and there's so much information about like, make a quick buck, May, you know, you should have your millions by 20, uh, 25 or whatever, like, you know, Iman Gazi and all those kind of like influencers or uh, business people, but who have made money at such a young, young age. age. Yeah, Man, so many teenagers are millionaires now. It's so like, I feel like I am so behind. behind. <laughs> What's happening? Yeah, so, so the, the reason yeah. I put in the book, hustle culture is out, <laughs> value culture is in. Mm-hmm. I mean, hustling is about working hard. That is definitely a work ethic that will, you should not go away. Right. But what I want you to do, or what I'm hoping you take away from reading the book, is that you think about how do you create value for people so that you're not burning out in this hustle environment, mm-hmm. right? You're constantly creating value for people. You're creating value for yourself. You're trying to find a way to be valuable for other people. Okay. And in order for you to be valuable for other people, you need to be valuable. So you need to have skills. Mm. You need to have knowledge. You need to have relationships. You need to have a strong personal brand. And that's what this book is about. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> amazing. This is so good. Um, how long did it take you to write a book? Um, actually, it took me like about six or seven months, maybe even a year to think through the chapters, the structure, the title, the name, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it took me like two months to write. What? Once I had the thing, it was just like- communications specialist. Yeah, I was like, it came, it, came, <laughs> it came out very quickly. But I'll tell you, the process of writing a book is simple. The process of selling a book oh, is impossible. Really? So if you're listening to this podcast, every sale matters to me. Please- Go to Amazon, pre-order the book. It would mean the world to me. It's in the link below, guys. It's in the link below. (laughs) Yeah, and there's a lot of stories in here from the Middle East, from working at Google and Netflix and the Prime Minister's office and Sheikh Mohammed's office and Obama and Super Bowl and NBA All-Star. There's some fun stories in there. I think a lot of people will be um, entertained as well. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm like, 
I'm excited for people to read this. I'm excited for people to get their hands on it because I think a lot of people in Dubai will find it super relatable, um, especially if they're on the, you know, career ladder, like trying to make it, trying to, you know, hustling, whatever they're doing to succeed. I think this will be very kind of something that they can kind of look to and be like, okay, I don't feel so alone. I don't it's feel a book so for anyone with ambition. If you're an entrepreneur, yeah. if you're a student, if you're mm -hmm. thinking about a side hustle, if you're not sure how to network or build your personal brand, and if you just want to know how to level up yourself to be more resourceful, this book is for you. Nice. Amazing. I want to end it, but I, I just also need to ask you one more thing. Sure. I want to ask you, who who has been your favorite person to work for? I mean, you, now you have a lot of clients, but like, I mean, oh, tell that's me. like asking somebody like parent, like, who's your favorite child? OK, fine. Maybe maybe people in your past, like past jobs and a past uh no, obviously that's a, that's a no brainer for me. It's Google. Like Google is the ultimate company to work for. What I learned working at Google will never be replicated. The experiences of what happened. I joined the company the day the Arab Spring broke out in Cairo. Mm. I uh, was in with the company during an incredible time in their history in the Middle East. Uh, we had, uh, uh, you know, the internet was a catalyst for change. It was an unprecedented time where we were able to launch a lot of products in Arabic, a lot of new products in the Middle East. Um, and I'm really proud to have been able to work there and what I learned from that experience. So unquestionably, uh, Google. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This has been awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. Guys, buy the book. All right. And if you like this video... Like, share, subscribe, comment, give us feedback, whatever you want to yes. do. Just say hi. <laughs> if you have questions, please feel free to DM me or to comment on this post with a question and we will answer them. Exactly. And Maha, where can the people find you? Um, at Maha Geber, M-A-H-A-G-A-B-E-R on mm -hmm. Instagram and Maha Bulanein on LinkedIn. Yay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.